Now, the phrase mechanism of media, I'm using to refer to the actual components of the media. That could be the technology, whether it's photography, video, the type of content, narrative, documentary, abstract, the style or genre, is it impressionism, is it surrealism, is it realism, the formal aspects, is it red, is it green, the classification of the content, which is, what do you actually see? Is it two men playing cards? Is it two women under a tree? Uh, the meaning, the concept, and the artists and the designers. So all together, I'm going to call this the mechanism. And typically, when people talk about art, they talk about the mechanism. What they don't talk about is the function. And what I'm primarily going to be talking about is the function of media, including art. And the function is really the intended purpose. Why was this created? Was it created to entertain, to inform, to produce profit? So when we examine media according to its mechanism, basically we get an understanding of what it is. But when we look at it according to function, we get an understanding of what it is, what it's trying to do. So what is the function of media? Well, this I'm suggesting is really related to, to aesthetics. And aesthetics um, being a branch of philosophy that is really concerned with the judgment of art with aesthetic value. And uh, Stefan Murawski is a philosopher who states it very clearly that aesthetics is really trying to answer two questions. What is art and what is good art? So what I'm proposing is that the value of media of any type, including art, is really not determined by its mechanism. It's really determined by its function. And the function of media is determined by the criteria that we use in our aesthetic judgments. So I'm going to start with this. Is this a good painting? So how many of you think that this is a good painting? Okay. How many of you think this is not a good painting? Okay, so this is basically making a judgment. Now, does anyone know there's something very special about this painting? Anybody know? Yeah, what is it? It's what? It's the most expensive painting ever sold. Now, if you would start Googling this, you would come up with hundreds of articles that are talking about this painting. The owner of this painting has not bought just a Gauguin. They have bought the most expensive painting ever sold. What is the function of this painting? And the function, I'm going to take the idea from Pierre Bourdieu, who says the function of high culture is really distinction. So what they have bought is this, this distinctive feature of owning the most expensive painting ever sold. And I'm suggesting that really becomes its function. And so what is the function of media? So the typical function of media including fine art and mass media, is to empower something, to empower an entity. And I sort of break this down into three types of entities. One is a concept, like what's a concept? Beauty is a concept. A person or an institution is an entity. So when we are judging art, it's not neutral. Something gets empowered by doing that. It could be providing them with social recognition, financial worth, authority, or whatever is being pursued by these entities. But the important point I'm trying to make is that what is, what is empowered is actually the criterion that we're using for judging the art. For example, um, the concept materialism is strengthened when a person considers an artwork to be good because it's expensive. When an artwork is considered to be good because it's exhibited at a specific uh, art institution, it's actually that institution that becomes uh, energized. An example of this, and I know this is true, once an artist's work has been exhibited at one of the, you know, a very prestigious institution, Museum of Modern Art, uh, um, the Tate, uh, the Georges Pompidou Center, that artist's work will probably increase by over 100 times overnight. Now, how can that be? The art is exactly the same. That increase in value, I'm suggesting, is really an acknowledgement of the authority of that institution. So the aesthetic judgment becomes a mechanism for really promoting these institutions. So here it is, the list. 
of now the five most expensive paintings ever sold. And you can see um, the majority of this information is really the value, and over on the right, the buyers and the sellers. So this is a very distinctive and very prestigious list. And what I'm suggesting, that really has become the function of this artwork. It's not about beauty. It's not about the concept. It is working basically to to um, enhance these particular entities, in this case, the individuals that have bought these paintings. Now, aesthetics basically examines what is good art, while the field of ethics examines what is good behavior. So another proposal I'm making is when a person makes an aesthetic judgment according to a particular concept, or we can call that a criterion, that concept really becomes a value. It becomes a determinant of that person's behavior. For example, if a person uses expensiveness as a value, they will treat expensive items to be good and inexpensive items to be not good. So as Peter Singer states, ethics deals with values, with good and bad, with right and wrong. So when an entity is promoted through an aesthetic judgment, an entity, again, could be a concept like beauty, could be a particular museum, that entity is given a certain social stratification, a degree of desirability and worthiness for the concept persons or institutions associated with that entity. And when an entity is given a high level of worthiness, it is treated with respect and given opportunities that are not given to other entities. In this manner, aesthetic judgment is ultimately an ethical decision because it functions as a mechanism for propagating certain behavior. Now, all of that I've spoken about is just the perspective for the main uh, topic of this talk, which is meaningful media. And what do I mean by meaningful media? I mean media that are humanistic, that are sincere depictions of media content that enhance the human condition by increasing an audience awareness and ability to endure. Now, this phrase, a human condition, really refers to the most essential and inevitable aspects of our existence, beginning with to be born and to die, and in between to age, to have emotions, to be different from others, to be social, to have conflict, to love, to have sex and reproduce, to, and to aspire. You notice the model of your smartphone is not on this list. And meaningful media can improve our lives by promoting the potential worth and goodness of humanity, emphasizing our common needs, and depicting realistic solutions to human problems. So we're going to jump back in history a few thousand years ago to something that is really part of the human condition, which is death. Death is inevitable. And throughout history, we have a large amount of artwork that is about death. So this is a Kask statue, and this is a statue that was typically put in a tomb when an important person would die, and it was believed this was the resting place for the Ka. The Ka was the enduring life force or spirit of a person when they died. And this is where this life spirit would be inhabited in this sculpture. Now, if we jump ahead a few thousand years to the Renaissance, as is a painting by Caravaggio, uh, St. Jerome writing, this would be classified as a memento mori. Memento mori, a Latin phrase meaning, again, remember that you will die because we are mortals. And both of these I would classify as meaningful media because they are really dealing with an aspect of humanity that is incredibly important. So let's look at death today. So this is a screen grab from YouTube that I took a few years ago. And this is a video someone has uploaded of Saddam Hussein being executed. So this is really death, but this is not a memento mori. A memento mori, the viewer is being reminded of their death. This is what would be, I would classify as providing a schadenfreude. There is not an English word for this, and what this means is the pleasure that is derived by watching someone else die or someone else suffer. And our media, films, news programs are full of schadenfreude pleasure from people's misfortune. Now, on the surface, that's what it looks like, but I would say, well, that's not really what its function is. Here is an advertisement for CJ Mall, which is a beauty salon offering women a 3 to 5% discount on hairstyling. Here 
is an online clothing store called Eight Seconds, and here is advertisement for Calvin Klein jeans. So the function, the ultimate function, is really to contain advertising. This is a quote from Eric Fromm, the psychologist. He wrote in 1955, we have radio, television, movies, a newspaper a day for everybody, but instead of giving us the best past and pres present literature and music, these media of communication, supplemented by advertising, fill the minds of men with the cheapest trash, lacking in any sense of reality, with sadistic fantasies which a halfway culture person would be embarrassed to entertain even once in a while. Here, from YouTube, dogs take shit in cars. So it's even more extreme than what From is, is talking about. A few weeks ago, I wanted an idea of what was out there, so I did Google searches on specific terms. And on the right-hand side, I'm classifying these terms as being the potential for meaningful media, and those on the left not. Remember, meaningful media are media that are sort of as enhancing the human condition. So what do we see? War comes in with over two billion items. What is in brackets are the videos. 219,000 videos about hate, and if we look, um, 219 million, kindness 15 million. So we have many more videos about hate than we do about kindness. Killing, 80 million videos. The Dalai Lama, 3 million videos. Murder, 73 million videos. Humanism, 540,000. We go to the bottom, dog shitting, 615,000 videos. Eric Crumb, 36,000. Human condition, 420,000. There is more information, more media of dogs shitting on the internet than about the human condition. Okay, this is the media world that has been created. Man farting, okay, one million, almost two million videos. Okay? In addition, though, to looking at the number of items, I also want to examine how popular are they. So in YouTube, it's going to tell you the number of views. Now, the most popular video in the world, meaning viewed, is a video called Gangnam Style, which is a music video that was made in 2012 by a Korean pop singer named, named Psy. And this is the most popular piece of media, you could say, in the world. Now, I wanted to compare this with Noam Chomsky, philosopher from MIT, the most popular video with Chomsky, meaning the one of the highest views, is called MIT Students Gangnam Style, where they are basically mimicking the video, and Chomsky appears for four seconds. So the song says, Opa Gangnam Style, Chomsky says, Opa Chomsky Style. So that's why it comes up. And this 5.2 million views is more views than any of Chomsky's serious videos. And the Chomsky interview that has the most views is him being interviewed by Ali G. Now, Ali G is a character created by Sasha Baron Cohen, who's the same comedian that does Borat and Bruno, that some of you are familiar with, and is completely ridiculous. And it has more views than serious videos of Chomsky. Now, what are some examples of meaningful media? This is film uh, from 1952, High Noon. High Noon is a Western film set in the 1800s. Uh, the plot is the city, I should say the town, had been a sort of a wild town with many criminals. Uh, the sheriff, being played by Gary Cooper, has sort of cleaned up the town, and these criminals have been put in jail. One criminal, though, is he has been set free, and he's coming back to town to kill Cain. Okay, and his name is Frank Miller. He's coming on the noon train. That's why the film is called High Noon. Now, remember that this character, the sheriff, had made this town safe, and because of this, he has no deputies. He's alone, and now none of the townspeople are willing to help the sheriff. They say, it's not our problem. Only a drunkard and a young boy are willing to help him. Well, this was quite a controversial film when it came out because it was viewed as being an open criticism of the American way and was accused of being a communist film. But it's an allegorical depiction 
of ingratitude and egocentrism, which is really part of the human condition. It's a depiction of this is reality. This is the world as it exists. Another example is The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, uh, set in the 14th century during the era of the bubonic plague. There is a knight who has been approached by death, character on the left here is death and the knight tries to bargain with death and says why don't we play a game of chess and if you win you can take me away but if not then you can't well eventually death wins and later in the film death comes to uh, the dinner party where the knight is with his wife and his friends and takes them all away it's a memento more. Again, it's an allegorical depiction of the inevitability of death, and I would say that this is meaningful media. So on the lovely topic of death, we have Mr. and Mrs. Smith, another film, uh, this one, a 2005 version, and listed as a romantic comedy action film. The plot is about uh, a married couple who are having difficulties in their marriage. Both of them are secretly working as paid assassins, but they don't actually know about each other's profession. But they eventually find out, and so do their employers who are competitors. So they hire Mr. and Mrs. Smith to basically kill each other. And they try, but they eventually say, why don't we actually work together? As a result, their marriage improves, including their sex life. So I would say this is, again, this is schadenfreude. This is not a memento more. Again, memento more is, is the audience being reminded they will die. A schadenfreude is you're watching other people die. Okay, now the real function of a film like that is economic. So this is a list of the, the highest grossing films. Um, and if you look at them, the majority of them are superhero films. I would say none of these relate to the human condition, except perhaps with the film Titanic, which is about a love story. If this is actually adjusted for inflation, the film that is, uh, has made the most money actually is, is Gone with the Wind. Now, how these types of numbers are being used by the film industry, whenever a new film comes out that has been produced by one of the major studios, all the news media around the world are saying, you know, Star Wars made $100 million within the first day. That is really being used as propaganda to tell you that this is the aesthetic judgment. You should go see this as well. It's being used as basically a mechanism. And this is what I was talking about at the beginning. It's trying to encourage you to really use materialism the economic value of something as criterion for judging, in this case, a film. Now, two very ancient terms that are related to what I'm talking about are acrasia and phrenesis. And acrasia is a state of mind in which someone is doing something that is actually really damaging to themselves. And this is a concept that has baffled um, uh, philosophers, starting with Aristotle, for thousands of years, because it just goes against this whole idea that humans are logical. Well, if humans are logical, why would they do things like, for example, be become addicted to a drug, to become addicted to anything that is damaging your body? So a question I'm asking, is it acrasia when a person selects to experience media that is diminishing the human condition or that occupies time that could be used with meaningful media. Well, phrenesis is the exact opposite. Another word for this is practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is when a person makes a judgment that really is beneficial for them. So the question is, is it phrenesis when a person selects to experience meaningful media that enhance the human condition? So what I'm suggesting is that no media are neutral. All media have the potential to enhance or diminish the human condition by promoting particular entities and the values that correspond with them. Why would a person select media that are only entertaining rather than selecting media that contribute to the human condition that would actually really improve the quality of their life? Can meaningful media also be entertaining? This is what my students tell me. They say, we don't want to watch this Bergman stuff. It's boring. It's black and white. We want to see Iron Man. 
So have meaningful media become meaningless? Has it become unimportant? Well, I think we're being tripped in a way, and here's Noam Chomsky. Um, Noam Chomsky wrote a book a number of years ago called Necessary Illusions that says mass media are being used to divert the public from what is important by keeping their attention occupied with whatever the public finds interesting, dog shitting in cars, for example. Media are being used as diversions, while the political class, the people in control, are free to make the major decisions regarding economics and politics. Another book has, has developed this idea into what is called the propaganda model, which Chomsky wrote with Edward Herman. The propaganda model considers the primary function of mass media to include, first, the accommodation of advertising, that mass media is simply a container for containing the real product of mass media, which is advertising, and the content of the mass media is being used simply to attract the audience so they can be exposed to the advertising. And the third uh, function of mass media is really to make the advertisers, the corporations paying for the advertising, to present them in a good light. Um, so the audiences of mass media are the product being sold. Now this is a very interesting statement. It's almost difficult to comprehend because in general we think, well, the product of mass media is the film. It's the television program. And Chomsky would say, no, that's the bait. It's really the audience that it's the product, and they are being sold to the companies that are advertising. A television program becomes a marketable product through its ability to attract the type of audience that is desired by advertisers. Now, a term I started using a few years ago is a media subterfuge. A media subterfuge means that the, the, the reason why certain media content is created is actually different from what the audience believes it to be, or, or what the producers are saying. And this is something I came across a few months ago. In Nashville, uh, an elementary school decided that they were going to show their gratitude for one of their janitors. So they told him to come into the gymnasium one day, and all the children were there cheering and clapping, and they gave him a check for $1,000, and everyone started crying. Well, you notice Kleenex, right? This whole event, the idea was really created by a company that makes tissue. And if you cry, you need tissue paper. So this, on the surface, looks like meaningful media. It's really saying, you know, we're all together. We're really grateful to this man. But it's a subterfuge. It's an advertisement is what it is. And I could give a thousand examples like this. And this is... At the beginning, I'm talking about the function of media, and often we are persuaded to focus on what the mechanism of media is, and what I'm talking about really is the function of media. So what I'm suggesting is basically all media are mechanisms of promotion. So media can promote entertainment, they can promote um, a certain individual, or they can promote something that is meaningful. Promotion is carried out through the judgment of media content as being good and the primary entities being promoted typically correspond with the criteria used to judge that content. Example, if beauty is used as a criterion for judging art, the concept of beauty in any persons or institutions associated with beauty becomes strengthened or promoted. If films are judged according to the amount of revenue they produce, the concept of materialism and value of money are strengthened along with the promotion of the actors, directors, and film studios that are associated with high-grossing films. So in conclusion, narrative and philosophical writings, poetry, theater, painting, music, and sculpture have provided cultural masterpieces throughout history that are truly meaningful and relevant to humanity. But the evolution of mass media and the internet has led to a world containing an inconceivable amount of digital content that is mostly frivolous or advertising for products and services. As digital media become increasingly ubiquitous, involved with nearly every aspect of our lives, it is pertinent to investigate how these media affect the human condition 
how our personal desires, feelings of contentment, and attitudes about life and death are influenced by the media we consume.